Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have come to that point in the conference where we're going to revisit the workshops and uh, hear briefly about what each of them discussed and, and their action points going forward. So if I may ask the, uh, pe the people who are presenting from the workshops who are in the room to uh, come and sort of gather to the side of the stage, that would be extremely helpful. Um, our first presentation will actually be online. We are truly hybrid, as well as having a hybrid workshop format, which was quite innovative. Um, so we'll hear from them in order. Uh, the first one being uh, Judith Russell, who will be talking us through implementing OA standards. I can't tell that they're there, so I assume they're there. Yes, the slides are up. Uh, thank you. I'm presenting on workshop A, which was enabling small independent publishers to participate in OA agreements. This was an effort that was supported by the Association of Learned and Professional Society Publishers and Plan S. And we are near the conclusion of our work and came here for the workshop to uh, share the information and get feedback. So we did review the work of all four task forces who had identified shared principles, example agreements, a data template, and workflows for OA agreements. Uh, we received many very constructive comments and suggestions from the participants. And we then discussed the use of the data template and how to get it widely adopted. And uh, we sought advice from the participants uh, for proposed plans to mobilize stakeholders. Next slide. We had many suggestions and I have only uh, given the time and space allowed, uh, highlighted here some of the major ones. Um, there was a sense that it was important to focus first on author provided and article data, things like ORCIDs and ROARs and funder IDs that were really critical for the institutions that were considering joining in these agreements in terms of identifying their authors um, and a, a desire to confirm that the data was sufficient for libraries and consortia to make these decisions. Although the working groups had done surveys and we feel fairly strongly that we have um, identified the things that were most needed uh, by the people who responded to the survey. Um, there was a recommendation that we clarify the metadata with a taxonomy to ensure consistent use of terminology since one publisher and another may use slightly different terminology and that that was particularly true for things like the article type that's one of the fields in the data template. Um, there was also a suggestion that uh, we prioritize going forward uh, having the publishers require things like ORCID IDs, recognizing that it would be difficult to acquire that data retrospectively if they didn't already have it, um, or to clean up data errors that may already exist, but that to the extent that the publishers uh, agree to use this, that if they can um, require some of these fields from the submitting authors, it will make the data more complete and accurate going forward. And then an agreement that there needed to be standards, uh, but also that those needed to be balanced with the recognition that if standards are overly rigorous, it's very hard to get agreement. Uh, the next slide, please. So the end purpose here was obviously to determine the next steps that we were going to take to ensure that the data template was adopted. And so we ended up with a number of uh, recommendations about that, one of which was to seek the endorsement of the template from uh, thought leaders and influencers among librarians and publishers, that that would be the most effective way to make it known and to have people trust in it and begin to use it. Um, we also acknowledge the need to research, uh, educate researchers uh, to make sure that they understand that they're going to be expected to provide consistent data, such as their ORCID and ROAR and funder ID, even to use their name in a consistent manner that will facilitate uh, the record keeping and the provision of data. Um, there was also a recognition that uh, we needed to seek ways to help small publishers fill in the gaps in this data if they did not already have it readily available. And that was partially true for the 
uh, historic data, but might in some cases be true for current information as well. And related to that, to encourage organizations like Crossref and ORCID and the peer review systems that many of the publishers use and other service providers to actually try to encourage their publisher customers, whether large or small, to agree to that these are the standard data that are needed and then to modify their systems to provide that data um, and facilitate delivery of that data to the publishers for then use in the data template. And I wanted to especially note that while the template was developed specifically for the benefit of small and independent publishers, the larger publishers should do no less, although they may choose to do more. There was a sense that this really could become much more universal than just for small publishers. And um, the conversation is going to continue with a webinar on February 28th. And there is a link there in the slide on the screen. And we hope that some of you will come or send your colleagues to listen in and participate in that discussion. And that concludes my summary of workshop A. Thank you very much, Judith. I'll now invite to the stage uh, Anna Sharman, who will be discussing early career researcher insights. Okay, this, so this workshop followed straight on from the ECR's um, panel session. So that uh, built on research from Anthony Watkinson and others asking uh, with interviews about um, lots of different issues uh, of interest to early career researchers. And so the question we asked in the first uh, workshop session was, well, what can publishers, institutions, libraries, and other people do to help with any of these problems? So we started off just giving the, we had sm three small groups and uh, asked them to just look at all the different things that had come up in that research and focus on, decide on what issues they wanted to focus on. And the three groups focused on three different issues. Next slide. So group one it came up with the statement that the peer review system is under pressure. ECR involvement could help, but there's a disconnection between ECRs and publishers. And I'll come up with their solution in the next slide. Um, group two was, was thinking about the biases in the peer review process. And group three, uh, said that information literacy skills are declining as ECRs stay away from libraries and librarians. Next slide. So they each came up with separate proposals um, that we'd like to put forward for you. So group one um, would like to set up an industry-wide work group, including ECRs, publishers, societies, funders, and librarians, to set a standard and to talk about peer review, to raise awareness and respect for peer review and to connect these st stakeholders together. There may be something similar already, but I think um, maybe some separate um, organization could be set up. So I'll leave it to, up to you to think who should uh, actually be doing that. Group two, um, talking about bias in peer review, they suggested a model that publishers could take up that might be the they thought the best way of doing peer review to have double anonymous peer review before publication to remove the bias at that stage. But then once the um, paper is published to make those reviews available to the public, but transparently as in without the names um, of the reviewers, unless the reviewers decided that they wanted to go for their optional attribution. And that way you maybe get the best of all worlds that you get the openness uh, of the peer review uh, comments, but also you, the, the peer reviewers' names are protected, um, and so they won't be worried about um, repercussions of saying something. Um, we gather that the Institute of Physics publishers are trying something similar, but without, uh, I think they're, they're having the names attached to all peer reviews that are provided after publication. So the suggestion in this group was that it actually might be better to make them transparent without the names. Um, to make this system work better, for, for especially for early career peer reviewers. So any publishers among you might want to consider that model and talk to the IOP for, for more ideas. Um, group three, we're talking about setting up or suggesting setting up a platform that teaches information literary skills, literacy skills, that is accessible through and across different institutions. Because at the moment, most institutions have their own training set up. Um, which aren't really connected to each other. 
and specifically for information literacy, all the looking up things and critical reading and stuff, it is crucial to have this um, available to everyone throughout their research career. And that this, it should be mandated as part of courses on research skills um, to, to, for people to actually have this and they'll be able to take their qualifications from it, from institutions to institution with their certifications and throughout their careers. So that sounds to me like a really good idea. Again, I'm not sure exactly who's going to set it up, um, but we'll leave that up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And next we have Kirsty Merritt, who's going to be talking about influencing positive change for open data. Hi. Well, this is going to be a challenge for me because I didn't write the slides. Who knows what I could find out at the moment when I uh, open them up. Um, so we looked at open data and how we could improve transparency and accessibility to data. And immediately the problem that we came across is that it should be fair data and not open data. So we revised on, on the fly. Um, and we thought about the different stakeholders that would be involved and how we can make these changes happen. So we looked at uh, intermediaries, um, publishers, institutions, libraries, repository managers, funders, and in the last moment, we realized that we had to kind of include the researchers as well, which we seem to have forgotten about at uh, an earlier point in the process. So we, we looked at the solutions that we could um, try and come up with. That was, the, that was the task that we set ourselves. And so the things that we found out over the, the two days and also from a published report that will come out soon that Lou's been working on at the um, International Bunch. Can I have the next slide, please? So we worked out that there was uh, lots of different things that we needed to try and pick our way through and wow, is it complex? Um, we came up with a, a, a system of trying to work out a racy analysis on it. And the one thing that we did learn from this is that that didn't actually work. There's too many interwoven parts for you to be able to pick them apart and analyze them very, very simply. There's no one solution. It needs to be a communication between all of those different players in the system. Um, we need to have that collaboration between publishers and institutions and researchers, but also with funders, because at the moment there seems to be people that are left out of the loop. Um, and we also need to have a much more centralised approach to reducing that wasted time and, and duplicated effort. I mean, in effect, it's what we do as research data managers, is we say that the reason that you put your data out there is because then it saves somebody else having to do the same thing again. And yet, as an industry, we seem to be doing the, that thing. We're reinventing, reinventing the wheel quite a lot. Um, so we've worked out that there's no quick fixes, but there were some areas where we could prioritize change. So we ran a Mentimeter on it, and we, um, these are the, I can't read, I can't see this on the, on the screen. Uh, these are the, the things that we've discovered were the, the most important things to change the system. And standardizing metadata seemed to be one of the most important ones. And then kind of in the middle somewhere was, was fair data, making sure that that is the thing that we're emphasizing. And then environment, um, the environmental impact of that was one of the other things that we considered. But we figured that you need to have made kind of inroads in the top ones first. Uh, next slide, please. So the next steps are that the publication from this workshop and the report that Lou has worked on will be um, sent out if you'd like to sign up to the email alerts at internationalbunch.com. And then we'll be also setting up a multi-stakeholder working group. If you want to be involved in it, then can, you know, do get, drop us a line. And that's the um, addresses of all of us if you want to get in touch. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Um, next, we're going to have a talk about the, a disability toolkit for scholarly publishing, um, and that will be Simon Holt, who's presenting. And um, if we can get his slide up, please. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Simon Holt, uh, and I'm Disability Confidence Manager with Elsevier. And I was one of the facilitators of Workshop D, um, a disability toolkit for the uh, publishing industry with Katie Alexander from Digital Science, Sylvia Hunter from Inera, and um, Erin um, Osborne-Martin from Wiley. Um, to set out the problem that we're facing and the reason that we wanted to have a discussion around this, 15% of the world's working age population have either a disability or a long-term health condition. That's over a billion people worldwide. 
and that's a substantial proportion of both our staff and our authors, editors, vendors, etc., etc., readers, etc. We feel that looking at other industries, the publishing industry is lagging behind, both in terms of inclusion and in helping people fulfill their potential. We've seen this even more in terms of the changes that have happened, not just within the industry, but within our workplace um, over the last two years because of the pandemic. A recent survey that um, undertaken um, by the UK Publishers Association said that only 6% of people within our industry identified as having a disability compared to 15% of the general population. And even more worryingly, two thirds of the people surveyed who said that they um, identified as having a disability said that they wouldn't feel psychologically safe to talk about it at work. We therefore felt that it was important as we look to make our industry more inclusive, more diverse, that we really tackle this. Our solution is that we want to create a set of resources, probably an online resource, um, to help stakeholders, both internally and externally, think about how to tackle this topic, both within their workplaces and within their, um, the wider scholarly comms ecosystem. So that's thinking about, you know, um, if people with disabilities, managers, um, allies, authors, vendors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We felt that it was quite important to have a one-stop shop that was um, relevant, particularly to our industry, so people know how to start tackling this important question. We therefore felt that it was quite important to start the conversation by understanding um, what the needs might be of different stakeholders and also thinking about what something like this might look like, which is obviously why um, we had this workshop. So what did we find out? What we found out was, um, first of all, we found out the common challenges faced by individuals at loads of different types um, of organizations. So, you know, big publishers, small publishers, libraries, um, academics, et cetera, et cetera. We also found that actually the kinds of information people were looking for um, was actually some quite fundamental information about terminology and also um, people want examples of what other people are doing, their, their peer publishers or their peer libraries, etc. So they can gain inspiration from that. People wanted also to find out not only where to start, but how to frame this. One of our key objectives um, when thinking about the toolkit was to convey a really empowering image of people with disabilities. Um, you know, I'm blind myself. But I've had, and I've had, I suppose, uh, a very good and you know, successful career in the industry, as have lots of other people. Because actually, when I see a person with a disability or a health condition, I see a problem solver. I see somebody who's adaptable. I see somebody who might be good at building relationships because they need to ask for help. As a wise, um, a wise person once told, once told me, you don't need to be able to see to have vision. And actually... When I think about the kinds of um, attitudes that traditionally lots of us talking in the workshop are found within the industry, they tend to be quite outdated um, stereotypes, shall we say. And what we want to do is move on from that. Um, in the workshop, it was quite clear, though, that everybody wants to think positively in this and get involved, but they're not quite sure where to start. So therefore, we want to be able to create a bit of a framework and a bit of a structure, and also to make sure that people don't feel on their own, right? It's okay for people maybe at big organizations who might either have HR departments or who might have staff networks they can go to, but a lot of our industry is still um, smaller organizations where you might have someone who doesn't really know where to go to. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is an area where we all need to work together. It's not a competitive sport. So this ho hopefully is the first instance um, or the first step towards working together and finding um, some common solutions. So what did we find out? So we found out apart from the common challenges and, and the things people wanted to know, we talked a lot about what such a resource, how it might be structured. And we talked about the different needs of different stakeholders, either in different departments or 
in different job roles and that kind of thing. And that made us think about how we might structure um, such a um, such a, a resource and also to think about what we might need to do next in order to make it happen. Because as you all know, having worked on various projects and programs in whatever field you work in, having a great idea is the first step. Understanding how to realize it is the real hard work. And that's really what we wanted to focus on in our workshop. So we've come out with some quite, con so we've come out with some quite concrete next steps. So the next steps now involve doing a larger engagement exercise. So that'll involve doing some kind of survey, maybe some focus groups to further establish, um, first of all, what the needs of the industry are. And second of all, to think about who might want to get involved, what resources are already exist within our community that we can collate. From there, we'll then come up with a, a firm plan of action, get to a, together a project team. Um, I don't think this is going to be the last. In fact, I know this isn't the last you hear um, about this particular project. So please look out for more information in the coming weeks as this starts to take shape. Certainly the workshop has really given us lots of ideas in terms of practically how to take it forward and what people might need. So I'd just like to take this opportunity not only to thank everybody who participated in the workshop, but also to research for Reader for letting us put the workshop on because um, it was really valuable, hopefully not just to us, but hopefully to the industry as a whole. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Simon. Um, next, to talk about OA Books, we have Stephanie Parvast. Hi, everyone, thank you. Um, yes, we were Workshop E, we focused on open access books, um, and the goal of our workshop was to create a set of recommendations that will help um, monographs be published sustainably in open access. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and we tackled this, um, uh, this, or we wanted to reach this goal via three um, uh, exercises that we set our groups um, uh, in the spatial chat and in the room. Uh, in the first exercise, we asked them um, to uh, complete with us the speedboat exercise. So, so you can speed, see the speedboat there on the top um, uh, right. The graphics are all copyright uh, Heather Staines. So if you have any requests, reach out to her. Um, we asked uh, um, our uh, participants to um, think of any challenge they could think of uh, that related to open access books and then um, group these challenges in uh, with the anchors of the speedboat. So what what are what uh, what is holding the speedboat back? Um, then in the second session um, uh, we uh, or at, and then at the end of the session we asked our participants to vote um, and to vote on one particular set of challenges that they felt was really the most urgent. Um, uh, in the second session, we asked them to complete the We Can If exercise, which really focused on, first of all, um, doing a deeper dive into the, the particular challenge that their group chose, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, then think constructively what kind of solution, uh, what kind of solutions there were for, for this, um, uh, for this issue. Um, and the two, the two main challenges that um, uh, evolved from the first session, were uh, funding on the one hand um, uh, and uh, value proposition on on the other. Um, so that we had lots of uh, uh, yeah really interesting, useful discussions in the second session. Lots of brainstorming, thinking about solutions. Um, and then in the third session, we asked them to plot these solutions on a graph that you see uh, in the bottom here, which from which ranged from solutions that were very practical, that could be maybe implemented um, to sort of more ideal solutions or what would you do in a utopian world. And we also asked our participants to think very clearly about who are the stakeholders involved, who are actually people who would be in control of these solutions. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what we, um, uh, so ultimately what we ended up with, um, uh, both for the funding and value proposition is, uh, that we really need a discipline-specific approach um, uh, that really, and uh, humanities and social sciences come to mind, but of course also mathematics. Um, also, the collective action models, uh, quite timely on, on the back of the uh, talk of Cameron Name this morning, I think. 
Um, philanthropic models was another solution that we identified where uh, maybe coupled with um, uh, a very, again, a discipline specific approach. So in particular research fields um, and also um, more clearly than maybe is the case now define really the value propositions for the stakeholders. So um, and that translates to ac the actionable steps. So one is that um, we thought it would be uh, uh, helpful to have a forum for open access book uh, publishers, um, but also uh, re circling back to the value proposition is maybe a consultancy project into what authors actually want in uh, specific disciplines and what they need, um, but also uh, the development of um, uh, discipline specific and book specific um, metrics to inform funding decisions, because these are now very much um, informed by SCM, of course, um, uh, and we felt that there was a, a, a vacuum there that, that we could fill. Um, and then getting back to the sort of the scale that we had from practical to utopian, these are definitely the more um, uh, practical steps. But for the utopian side, if you could hit the next slide, please. Yeah, we also identified that Elon Musk would probably be the answer to all of our problems. Um, so that was the, the ultimate uh, solution that we also ended up with. Um, yeah, so that was it. Um, I think we had a great constructive uh, session. It was very valuable, lots of uh, constructive conversations, and I look forward to uh, hopefully, um, uh, yeah, uh, taking up, you know, steps, next steps for some of these uh, steps that we identified. So thank you very much. Also, thank you to Heather Graham, who was the main facilitator for, uh, for our uh, sessions. Thank you, Stephanie. And finally, we have Andrew Powell's talk about low and middle income country access. Thanks. So we always save the best till last. And, and because we start a little early, I think we've got an extra couple of minutes as well. So workshop F was returning to a topic, a generic topic that we've actually discussed at three, two or three previous research to reader conferences. And it's about the challenge of creating better um, equity in our research communication ecosystem. Previously, we've looked at the specifics of open access and making that a tra an equitable transition. Um, and the challenge, the problem that we were discussing this time around um, was that as we strive for greater global equity in the entire research communications ecosystem, what structural changes could be made so that researchers in lower and middle income countries are not being economically disadvantaged at all stages in the research life cycle. So we're going well beyond just their ability to, to access or to publish, but just generally their ability to participate um, in the global discourse. And as a, a, as a novelty this year, and uh, supported by the hybrid environment, we actually thought it would be a good idea to invite some of the researchers from the lower and middle income countries to talk to us. So our first session was run very much as a sort of an online focus group where we heard the lived experiences of, uh, of users and librarians around um, the, the lower and middle income countries so that we weren't just speculating um, on their behalf. So next slide, please. And I'm not going to read everything on this slide. The reason I captured as much as, as I did, and of course we have the challenge of, 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 um, of digesting some very, very rich discussions into a, a very small number of slides. Um, but what we heard was that there are a huge number of obstacles facing um, researchers and their um, institutions and their support networks in lower and middle income countries as they try to establish their position in the, um, in the scholarly, scholarly discourse. And they're not, it's not just about not having the money to pay for APCs or not understanding how to claim an APC waiver. The challenges and barriers are much um, broader uh, than, than just that. And so we captured quite a number of challenges, um, a lack of understanding of the gen, of the publishing landscape at all, um, and common practices like um, or, or, or dis, dis, you know, poor practices like plagiarism, not understanding how um, predatory publishing works and its impact, its negative impact. So a huge number of areas for capacity development um, within this community. Um, next slide, please. So we talked um, in different breakout groups about the sorts of changes that, that should be made to address some of these barriers and recognizing that these are complicated issues and every country is different. So there is never going to be a one size fits all. Every discipline is different. Um, 
we, we as, a as, a, as a group of, of people coming from different parts of the industry and different parts of the community felt that there were some areas that we could have some influence over and collectively we could make some, some really significant change. So we looked at the level of transformation that's needed at the institutional level, whether that be around um, the incentivization of researchers to publish in a particular way, um, the way we assess and uh, assess the impact of research and the way we apply different metrics to different um, types of research and in different parts of the world. Another group looked at the transformation needed within the publishing mechanism itself, the workflow at the, so at the workflow and publishing level. What can publishers do um, within their own uh, infrastructure and their own internal mechanisms to promote greater equity and promote greater participation? So that could be providing training. It could be um, crucially offering language support because we heard a few times that um, those who don't have English as their mother tongue could really come up against some significant obstacles. We understand, we know that the, the pool of, poop of, of um, peer reviewers and editorial board members, um, the, the, the lower middle income, income countries are sorely underrepresented in those uh, um, areas. So what can be done to try to stimulate um, improvement? And a third group looked at transformation, the way that we network, the way that we communicate and the way that we develop our reputations and our, and our, um, uh, our communities of practice. How to connect not just north to south, but south to south and crucially as well, south back up to north. Um, next slide, please. I sound like Chris Whitty. It's great. Um, so our, finally, we, we talked about what practical next steps could be taken. Um, firstly, we agreed that there was a great need for further capacity development, further training, potentially in collaborations with, with, co with collaborative uh, platforms that already exist, like um, Research for Life. Um, Research Life already provides training um, and leverages its networks in, in many different areas, and maybe what the training that's offered could be expanded to include a lot of these new areas, such as the use of social media, um, for, for networking and for personal development, um, and that greater uh, uh, and richer explanation of the evolving open access landscape. One thing that we've done recently within Research for Life, and I'd like to thank um, Rob Johnson from Research Consulting for working with us to create user personae that we can use to really view our service offer through the eyes of our of our users. Um, and we can publish these user persona and make them available and expand on them and develop them so that anybody can internalize them and say, okay, well, if this is my user, how are they going to respond to the changes that I'm planning to make? So that was um, a, a useful um, recommendation. We also agreed that the value of having the voices in the room that we had on um, yesterday was was fantastic. And it, it made our discussion so much richer and so much more um, sort of real world. Um, and we all felt that we wanted to build on the positive aspects of these virtual hybrid meetings to improve diversity inclusion in conferences. Um, recognizing that, you know, certain disciplines will find it harder than others, certain parts of the world will find it harder than others, but we should all, we, there must be a way for everybody, in, no matter what field they're working in, to improve the representation from the Global South within their meetings. Um, we particularly were, were looking at the, the challenge around um, uh, poster sessions at scientific conferences and how you might replicate the sort of networking um, that, that takes place there. Um, then, the, the role of the Sustainable Development Goals in, in, in providing a framework for greater equity was uh, something we also discussed. And we felt that we could encourage closer alignment with the SDGs for all sectors of, of, the, um, of our ecosystem. So whether it's to do with um, the SDG Fellowship for researchers, the SDG Publisher Compact, any publishers in the room who haven't yet signed the SDG Publisher Compact really should do, um, because it looks at the way that you can become a more sustainable organization internally, but also how you can leverage your position as a publisher to help to achieve the overall goals set out in the SDG agenda. Um, we also finally looked um, at the, 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 the potential to, ex to set, to, or at least to encourage and explore quotas for editorial boards um, and other aspects of our publishing processes, recognizing that we want to avoid tokenism and recognizing that disciplines that are already struggling to achieve greater gender balance um, might find this quite, quite a challenge, but it should be set out there as, as a, a challenge for, um, for um, creating greater equity. So next step, we, we also agree that we wanted to keep this discussion moving forward. We don't want to wait another year before we have another researcher to read a conference to, to see how far we've got. So the conveners, the facilitators um, of this session um, have agreed 
to facilitate um, another session in around six months um, to bring our group back together again and see what progress we've made. By that time, the new, the new Research for Life strategy will have been adopted by its general partners. Um, so we should be able to see some progress um, on that front. So if anybody who wasn't in our workshop would like to be part of this discussion going forward, then drop an email to either Aaron, Husta, or myself, and we'll make sure that you, um, you get included in any invitation to, to attend future meetings. And with that, it's bang on three o'clock. And uh, I think we're due for our next set of lightning talks. Thank you. <laughs>